Hello and welcome to the very first episode of Beards and Cars in 2022, 1st of January of the new year, and what better way to kick off the new year than by featuring a Bentley, a car which, myself included for a long time, I really wanted and it has a similar kind of vibe, a similar kind of price range to cars which I would buy like the Jag XKRs and the Maserati Quattroportes, but there's just something about a Bentley which just seems like a big risk. And that is the purpose of this video. We're talking about, yes, how fast the car is, what kind of space it has, kind of used values, you know, how does it drive, but also with my perspective as, spoiler alert, the owner of this car, what is it actually like to live with? What are the real expenses going to be? And crucially, is it too much of a risk? Well, the fact alone that I bought this car, I would say speaks volumes initially to that risk of purchase question, because I certainly deemed it a modest enough risk to actually buy one, and thousands of other people do own Bentleys, and many of them love them. Some probably don't, and that actually brings me to the first major piece of advice which I would give you when it comes to actually buying one. Because there are two bits of advice which I really want you to take away from this video. One is about buying one, and one is about owning one. First of all, when it comes to buying a Bentley, it doesn't have to be a Flying Spur, which is the one that I got. It could be the Continental GT, the two-door, could be the GTC with the open top, could be the Speed version, etc, etc. could even be something like an Anage. But, the key thing is that whatever your budget allows for, look for the least amount of owners and the most amount of service stamps. And the reason why I say that is because Bentleys fall into a very distinct category, which many cars of this caliber do, wherein if you see a long list of previous owners, that is usually a red flag. Because you'll notice that if you divide that amount of owners by the amount of time that the car has been around for, they'll often be around like a one or two year swap period. Well, that could mean a few things, but most likely it means that people bought the car without really knowing what they were getting into, and as soon as an issue came up, or as soon as they actually saw the price of a service, they moved on to something new and sold the problems, you know, innate problems, problems that were yet to surface, etc., to the new owner. That is absolutely going to be a risk. I would also not necessarily recommend buying one with crazy high mileage, because the risks there are going to be that much higher. Yes, it is a continent-crushing, motorway-loving limo, but still, the higher the mileage, the greater the wear. That's just the way it works. Mine, for example, has 83,000 miles, which is moderately high. It's not crazy, but it is higher than some people would be comfortable with. But as you can kind of tell from what I mentioned just now, my advice on buying one is to get, as I mentioned, the least amount of owners, and the car that has shown from receipts and from work and from history and from the owners and how long they've had it, that it has been treated as a vehicle of this caliber should, and that it has been loved. Now when I say that it's been loved, I wouldn't even say that it has to have a full Bentley stamp history. Me, for example, I'm planning to get mine serviced very soon, but it's not going to be by Bentley. And the reason for that is because, for those of you who don't know, I'm a mechanic myself. I've looked at the Bentley service menu, and even for an in-depth service, there is nothing special about that list. Now, the interesting thing about this, and this actually ties over into my second piece of advice, is that it's not so much that any particular thing on a Bentley is overly complex, it's more getting to it. <laughs> That's the problem. Because these cars are so obscenely heavy for a reason. They are packed full. Every part of this car is packed full of engineering and tech and luxury, so any simple thing is usually a pain in the ass to work on. Take, for example, a prime example, mine. When I purchased this car, it had a side light bulb out. Now that's the two more central lights on the front. It's not a Xenon, thankfully, it's one of the smaller yellow kind of standard style bulbs. And it's a job which for many cars, even exotics, would be fairly simple. You know, you open your bonnet, pop the back of the light off, maybe even unscrew the light for better access and swap out the bulb job done. In the case of a Bentley like one of these or a GT, that's a 400 plus pound job plus VAT with four hours of work and taking the entire front bumper off for a Bentley quote unquote specialist to change that bulb for you. 
Now I can tell you categorically, you do not need to take the bumper off. In fact, there's at least one video on YouTube of a mechanic going through the top of the engine, taking simply the air filter and the throttle body out of the way, and swapping the bulb without even removing the bumper at all. So much like a Maserati, unfortunately there is an element there of paying for the badge, not for the actual service provided. And another reason why I can say that for a fact is because unlike a Maserati, wherein you could kind of make a, a decent argument for it being a super bespoke, hyper rare vehicle, which is mostly handmade and, you know, Ferrari underpinnings, etc., so you can justify the specialist prices, this is a Bentley. It's a UK brand. There are thousands of them on the road, and it uses Volkswagen tech, much of which is shared with other models like the Phaeton and the Audi A8. So rare, these parts are not. Bespoke, these parts are not. So paying for a specialist to fit something which could just as easily have a Volkswagen badge on it instead of a Bentley, I take fundamental issue with, especially when they deliberately charge those kind of prices and take that kind of time. In some cases, if you are, for example, as I am a mechanic, there are a lot of things that you'll be able to do yourself. Get yourself an OBD reader, you know, to, to check and clear codes, clear service lights if you do a full service yourself, etc. And I, as I said, plan to do a service on this one, but not from a specialist. I've got a guy who's worked on all of my cars, from the Maserati to the Jag to the V10 Touareg. He's competent and adept at what he does, and I've never been let down by him. He's not a specialist, but he knows what he's doing, and that's what actually matters. Now, if you care about resale value alone, then sure, take it to a specialist. If you actually care about living with the car and enjoying it for yourself, rather than just keeping it good for the next owner, which is what I plan to do, then get it done in a way that you know the value for money is there and that you're not just paying for the badge. And tying into that point is the fact that in terms of reliability, in terms of costs, you'll get various quotes from, for example, other owners of what kind of budgeting you should do throughout the year to service one of these. And much of that will depend on if it breaks, what goes wrong, etc., where you take it to service it, but it tends to be between like the 1500 and 3000 pound region, which could sound very daunting, but if you actually add up what you spend on a car throughout the year, that's probably about what you should realistically expect to budget for any luxury car, just in case something goes wrong. And the vast majority of things which will go wrong with these tend to be electrical. So very similar to my experience with the Touareg in that regard, unsurprisingly for the Volkswagen Tech. And it's those jobs where on the surface of things, much like that bulb, they're not a complicated job, it's just getting to it which makes it more awkward in the case of a Bentley. Now, in terms of what you actually get, because it probably sounds to some of you like it could be a major pain in the ass, is it actually worth it? What do you get from this car that, for example, you couldn't just buy a Jag and get a lot cheaper? You know, something like a, an XFR or an XJR even, the traditional Jag. It has much of that similar kind of performance, a similar kind of comfort level. Well, of course, with a Bentley, much like Maserati, you are to some degree buying it because it's a Bentley, because it's just that step above. It's like saying you've got a Jag versus I've got an Aston, or I've got a, a Porsche versus I've got a Maserati. There's just different calibers of vehicle in terms of wow factor. So could I have bought a Jag for less? Absolutely. But I've already had a Jag, and I wanted to try something different. This is a car for somebody who specifically wants a Bentley. Don't just buy a Bentley because you can afford one. You do need to want one, otherwise you may as well honestly get yourself a Jag. Because on that surface level tick list, you know, leather, comfortable, air ride, good performance, nice sounding engine, British, you know, elegance and luxury, it ticks a lot of those boxes. It's just that a Bentley is a step above in every way. So speaking to what you do get, it's an absolute beast of a car. There's no other way of saying it. It's a 6-litre twin-turbo W12 engine, 552 horsepower, 480 pound-feet of torque, and the performance is shockingly quick for something of its size and weight. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with the dimensions of one of these, of course, the GT, the two-door, which most people tend to love, for obvious reasons, and even I agree that the shape on that one suits it more, and we're going to get in a second to the reason why I purchased this one over the GT, that one is extremely heavy anyway. This is even more. This is like a 2.6 ton limo. It's essentially as heavy as most SUVs, like an Audi Q7 or a Range Rover. The performance, though, 
can blow most cars on the road into the weeds. 0 to 60 is around 4.7 seconds, and of course, it was the fastest four door car in the world of its time. 195 miles an hour or thereabouts, and in the case of the GT Coupe, more like 198 miles an hour. And of course, if you buy the speed version with even more power, the 600 horsepower models, which you will pay a lot more for, then those can do over 200, I believe like 204 miles an hour. So genuine supercar performance in something with the weight of an SUV and the luxury and panache of a wedding spec limo. So as I alluded to, yes, something like a Jag or a Beamer or a Mercedes AMG does tick a lot of those similar boxes, but until you actually drive a Bentley, you'll have to take it from me that there is a difference, trust me there. I've reviewed a lot of those other models, and yes, they're very nice, but a Bentley does feel a cut above. And for what was around a £130,000 car when new, you would kind of hope that it would, and that it does. Well, it does. This is a phenomenal bit of kit, and I actually believe the Continental Range is one of the best British ideas for a car, albeit not exactly a British idea in its source, in years. And you can kind of tell how good an idea it was because of how long in the tooth it's become. Albeit with revised versions, new engines and facelifts, it's been around for quite some time now. It's a great idea for a car, and it's a truly remarkable piece of kit, given what it can do. This car should not be anywhere near as capable as it is. If you just want the luxury side and even more space, and more of a traditional approach, then you could look into maybe something like a Bentley Arnage, or even the older Turbo R if you want that classic vibe. This one is very much new school Bentley, and in that regard, funnily enough, it actually reminds me of my thoughts on the Jag XFR. That is new money Jaguar. It's a younger man's Jag, which still appeals to the older sensibilities, but has that more new age approach. It's tighter, it's more taut, it's faster. This is exactly like that for Bentley, and especially when it first came out. I don't recall many people disliking it, but I'm sure some purists did, because it's such a different approach to a Bentley. But it's... it's dominatingly, crushingly capable in every way. The space is insane. This is a 17 and a half foot long car, and at the mirrors, it's 7 feet wide. So small, it certainly isn't. The funny thing is, though, I never have trouble parking it because A, I love driving big cars anyway, but it fits into any UK parking space with just a little bit of overhang on the back end. And of course you have stuff like parking sensors to help, but I honestly find this easier to park and more manoeuvrable than the Maserati Quattroporte was. Part of that is the all-wheel drive, part is the superior turning circle, but part is just the fact that, yes, it's very big, but it almost feels big in a, a more compact way, which doesn't really make sense, but if you drive both, I think you'll kind of feel what I'm talking about. There's not as much overhang on this car as it feels like there is in the Maserati, as much as I adore that car as well. Now, in terms of using this car as a daily driver, which, spoiler alert, I do, well, fuel is another thing that we need to talk about. Well, actually, the fuel is both very good and very bad, and it all depends on two things. And you could kind of say this about any car, really, but you, let's just say, really notice this when it comes to a Bentley. A, the type of driver you are, and B, the type of driving that you do. So, in other words, the kind of routes, etc. Now, first of all, when I drove up to pick up this car in the Maserati, and then I drove this back home via the same route, this had superior fuel economy overall to what the Maserati Quattroporte did, which is remarkable. A 550 horsepower car that weighs 600 kilos more than the Maserati with only 400 horsepower and an engine that was 4.2 litres compared to this one 6 litres. This has also all-wheel drive, technically an even older gearbox. It's just, across the board, shocking that this could even come close. In my Quattroporte, I would average maybe 22 to the gallon-ish at best. In this, on the motorway exclusively, it was anywhere between 24 and 30 to the gallon at between the 60 and 70 mile an hour range, either with or without the slipstream of cars and trucks being in front of me. Now, of course, a lot of people will immediately judge me by saying, why on earth would you buy a 200 mile an hour Bentley and then do 70 miles an hour in it? Well, for a couple of reasons. One, I'm not looking to waste fuel just because I can and have an unnecessary level of cost. And B, 
I'm not looking to get a ticket or be pulled over either. So yes, you can drive a lot faster than that if you want to, but it's not exactly advisable, especially in something which attracts as much attention as a 17 foot long moonbeam silver Bentley does. So it's a personal preference and I don't expect anyone else really to follow that kind of motto when driving, but that's my advice for what it's worth and take it or leave it. In terms of the overall experience of fuel economy, as I said, it drastically changes depending on how you drive it and where you drive it. On the motorway, it's fantastic. It loves to cruise, it's built for that, and the weight just falls away. However, around town, it drops like a stone, and it is easily the worst fuel economy of any car I've had. The best, ironically, of any car I've owned was that V10 Touareg, which could average about 26 as well. But even that around town would drop like a stone as well. This, you're looking at like 9, 10 to the gallon average if you just drive it around a city. So it really does depend on where you drive it. And even when I reviewed the Continental Convertible Speed version, the GTC, that is the first car I've ever driven where I actually noticed the fuel gauge dropping as I accelerated. And that was when I really put my foot down. So that's the kind of thirst that these cars can have, but that's only when you push them really hard. In this car, I could basically blow away most other cars on the road if they wanted a race, but my fuel tank would empty insanely quickly. Drive it sensibly though, drive it, I mean, sorry, but drive it like a Bentley is generally intended to be driven and you'll be surprised by how good the economy can be within a certain range. So can you use one of these every day? Absolutely. It has more than enough space, the comfort is wonderful, the performance is monumental. More performance than the car really needs, to be honest, but it's fantastic to have it. The handling is shockingly good for its size and weight, there's next to no body roll, even when you're not in sport mode. And yeah, it's, it, it's simply put a colossal amount of car for the money. If the risk is too high for you, and if you don't specifically love the idea of a Bentley, then I would strongly recommend getting yourself something like a Jaguar XFR or even an XJR for even less money. They are fantastic and very capable cars. If you want something with the badge panache but need more you know, practicality, then you might want to look into something like a Porsche Panamera with the 3 litre diesel engine, because that's a very much so best of both worlds kind of car. The Bentley is a specific taste, it's exactly my kind of car, I love it so far, and we'll have to see of course in the long run, and you'll have to stay tuned for the long term owner's review, but ultimately that's it for my thoughts, it's a superb bit of kit. And to top it all off, the last little tidbit of information that I'll give is that even though I do prefer the look overall of the coupe, the reason why I went for this one is fairly obviously the space, because I need to use the back seats of the car a lot more than most GT owners ever would, but also this car is just a fraction more reliable for none other reason than it doesn't have an active rear wing. And on the GT, the coupe, it does have an active rear spoiler at the bottom of the rear window, and they are quite prone to failure. So technically, that's one thing that I'll never need to worry about <laughs> on this car. And with the Bentley, ticking any risk off the list is fine by me. And that I said was going to be the final point, but the final final point, because I just remembered this one, is that this is absolutely one of those cars, much like the Porsche Panamera, which I hated the look of, then drove one and fell in love with it, likewise with this one, pictures and video do this car no justice at all. There's something about the way a camera captures this car which makes it look more bulbous and dumpy when you actually see it in person, even the back end which I used to hate. This is a remarkably impressive looking car. It is dominating, it has incredible sheer presence, especially in, for example, this bright silver that I've got, and it looks, trust me, so much better in person than it ever would in a photo. To the point where I have no regrets at all in purchasing this one over the GT. Ultimately though, that's it for my thoughts on the Continental and the Continental Flying Spur. More specifically, check out that other review if you are interested in the two-door version, and of course, stick around on the channel for more car reviews in future. Or, perhaps even some more Bentley videos in future, who knows. But, until next time, I'll see you then, and for now, as always, thanks for watching.